worship Christ the King. Alleluia, amen. Praises to him we bring. Alleluia, amen. With grateful heart and voice, before his throne rejoice. Praise is his gracious choice. Alleluia, amen. Good morning. Happy New Year, by the way. I know we uh, kind of did that a few days ago, but it's, uh, it's the first Sunday of the New Year. Uh, I think we're getting our first rain of the New Year. I think we are. We were earlier. And uh, a lot of things are new. And as we uh, start over, I want us to uh, I want us to kind of focus our hearts not on a resolution sort of Thing, uh, but almost more of a making thing, and uh, I think you'll think you'll see that as as this develops. Well, there's this phrase out there called a duo. Now I don't know about you, but there have been a lot of times that I felt like I did something wrong, and I went back to do it over, and I did exactly the same way the first time. Wrong, wrong again. Um, and, and sometimes a, a do-over is really not what we're after. When we get, when, as I said, we might be thinking more like a makeover. Uh, could we do this in a better way? Certainly, can we do it right? Maybe. Um, I wanted this to start today in this uh, in this series that we'll look at all this morning. Looking at the alternative to a do-over. I want to go back to a uh, passage in uh, Second Chronicles. You will recognize at least the second verse of this passage. Uh, but I wanted it to kind of set the tone for, for what I hope for in this series. And uh, God is speaking and he says, If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name, humble themselves, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from the wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now that's that's kind of global <laughs> in its uh, response. And, I, and what I want to look at today is kind of personal, but understand that like a lot of things, you know, the drivers out there on the highway are probably hopefully, you know, at least as good as you are. But generally speaking, you know, what we are is what everyone else is. I mean, that's, that tends to be how it goes. In fact, uh, the days of the church setting a tone and having, having higher quality lives is, is getting to come into question these days because sometimes Christians don't really live different from the world. And so there is a factor that's society-wide, but the society is a group of individuals. And so when we think about a makeover, when we think about making me over, then in turn, society changes. The same way a home changes if one person makes a change. A lot of times it's focus on the other person changes. And, and really, the best way to change something is to change is me and to watch then what that does somewhere else. There's a promise in Acts chapter 3. And this comes from the preaching of Peter. He's actually, uh, at this point, speaking to people who really need to hear this and they're not listening. But uh, it also gives us the title for today that I want us to focus on. This is Acts chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. And Peter says the things which God announced beforehand by about all the prophets that as Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. So when you get this, you know, Jesus came and Don's mission this morning in flesh. And he suffered. He was crucified. He was buried. He was raised again. All that's been fulfilled. Everything the prophet said has happened. Therefore, here's what needs to occur, Peter said. Repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing 
they come from the presence of the Lord. Now, refreshment, it's not usually a winter term, right? We think of being out in the summer, we're working out in the sun, and we're hot, and we're, what we need to do is sit down and have a refreshment break. Well, yeah, but there's another type of refreshment that I want to focus on this morning, and that is the fresh start. Not do over. Not let's do it again on the end. Not let's do it again sort of. Let's just act like nothing ever happened and let's start fresh. Let's begin again. And that word for refreshing is associated with another R word in the passage, and that is the word repent. Now, you read the Bible. And you're going to find that there are people throughout the Bible that need to repent. And sometimes it was very short-lived. There's a whole period of history after the conquest of Canaan where there was a time ruled by what was called judges. Um, that particular phrase, that, you know, a particular area or tribe would have a judge who would come and, and deliver them constantly. They were deliberate as much as anything. But what would happen is the enemies would gain uh, the foothold against God's people in the promised land and maybe kind of a tribal sort of area way. They'd come and they'd mow down all their crops or kill all their animals or somehow keep them from really surviving. And so it would cause people to say, well, what's wrong, God? God usually takes care of us. And, and you know, God would say, yeah, well, usually you worship me and not those idols you worship me. So, you know, if you want God to deliver you, maybe I should sit back, let you see how it works without God, and then maybe you'll return again. But what would happen is God would raise up a judge and this person would deliver them. That it was a short lived repentance. When the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them from the hands of their enemies, all the days of that judge. But the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who were oppressed and afflicted them. But came about when the judge died, they would turn back and act more corruptly than the fathers in following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not abandon their practices or their stubborn ways. That word stubborn is used often for God's people. And if you are, you shouldn't be. Not a good thing. God tries to get our attention. God tries to say, I'm here. Could we, could we have the relationship that I originally designed in the Garden of Eden? Could we walk and talk together? Could, could you just entertain what I say so you can have a smoother life? Or do you really have to do this your own way? And that sometimes turning back to God is a short-lived thing. Now, the word repentance involves a couple of ideas, and I, I want to I look at those. I want to show you some passages. And I want us to see how repentance is so much more than just a do -over. It's so much deeper. One, it involves regret. Now, in Jeremiah 8, when you read about people who had none, so here's what that looks like. These are God's words again. He says, I've listened and heard. They spoke of what is not right. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his horse, like a horse charging his back. No one said, What have I done? What went wrong? There, there is no sense of regret, God complains. There's no sense in which this person looks at what happens and says, hmm, maybe I shouldn't have done that. And so, if you're going to repent, we'll get into more of what that means, but one of the very first steps involves some regret, some sadness about what has occurred, some questioning of what has happened or what you have done. And that question may come from someone Number two, I'm sorry. You say, well, that sounds like regret. Well, not exactly. 
And I want you to, I want you to hear how I'm sorry is just a seed. It's a beginning place. I'm sorry might express regret, but there could be a problem here. And we'll look at that. The best passage, I think, in the whole scripture about the, term, the concept of repentance is 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to read uh, three verses here that, that really talk about a very specific situation where people were sorry and how that began to flesh out and how it led to other things. Paul has written a letter to the Corinthians and he's chided them, rebuked them for something that they're doing and what they're allowing to, to exist among them. And uh, so he wrote this letter, and, and he was not happy, and boy, they were not happy with the letter. But it caused that regret, and it caused things to change. And so here's, here's Paul talking about it after the fact. He says, though I cause you sorrow, sorrow by my letter, I, I do not regret that, though I did regret it. For I see that letter caused you sorrow. Though only a little while. Now I rejoice, not that you remain sorrowful, but you remain sorrowful to the point of repentance. You remain sorrowful according to the will of God. Now, Paul explains there's two kinds of being sorry. He says, so that you would not suffer loss in anything through us, the sorrow that's according to the will of God produces repentance without regret leading to salvation. The sorrow of the world produces death. Now, my best way to illustrate this, honestly, is with a very familiar sorrowful person. Do you remember Judas? Judas who betrayed the Lord? Judas who sold his friend and his master for 30 pieces of silver? And then when he saw what was happening to Jesus, he, he was sorrowful about it. And he took his money back and tried to give it back. And then went out and hanged himself. They didn't want to. You, you've met people who were sorry. You've had children who looked at you and they said they were sorry. And you realized what they were sorry for is they got caught. They're not really sorry they did something. They're sorry to have to go through the negative associated with what they did. And so a sorrow that doesn't go to the right place, that doesn't produce a change in this person, leads to death. Now this word regret gets thrown in here, unfortunately, because it's you know it's kind of an English word that I just brought up and I said this is part of it, and it says, well, you know, good repentance doesn't involve regret. Well, in other words, good repentance is more than just regret. And it's certainly more than regretting that I'm in trouble because I did this. What these people did is they were sorry that they did what they did, but they were sorry enough to change the future so that it did not happen continually. And so Paul says, verse 11, Behold, what earnestness this very thing, this, this godly sorrow has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong, everything you demonstrate yourselves to be innocent in the matter. Now that verse is impactful. Let's look at some of those words. Because they're all important. I'm not going to use them in the order Paul did, but, but number one, you know that when there's something that goes wrong, one of the first emotions that we feel is fear. We're like, ooh, that shouldn't have happened. I wonder what might be the consequence. Earnestness is a part of repentance. That, that causes us to say, you know, uh, we, we have got to do something about this. I want this made right. And I'm going to get busy, and I'm going to, I'm going to see what I can do to make this situation right. Indignation, it, and sometimes the word righteous indignation is used to describe anger. 
you realize that sometimes when something wrong occurs, someone says, wait a minute, who did that? Why did they do that? They should be punished. Well, that indignation is part of what can cause the godly sorrow to begin. Honestly, if we lived in a world where there were no consequences, that's, that's like anarchy. Everybody just does whatever they want to. In fact, did you know that that's how the period of the Judges was described? There was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Well, no wonder it was such a yucky period of history. If everybody just did what they wanted to, and, and nobody could really say anything about it, there was no feedback, there was no objection, there was no anger, there was no indignation, you would really be in trouble. But in a situation where you're going to see repentance, fear and earnestness and indignation are accompanied by vindication. There's this, there's this sense of there needs to be justice. There needs, this needs to be made right. And that can come from the person who's doing the changing, and that can come from the person who's insisting on the change. And there is a longing. There's a desire for the relationship to be restored. A lot of times when we hurt someone's feelings, we don't want them to be hurt, but we also want to still be around them. And so there's a longing. Well, what can I do to make up for this? How can I make this right? And the Corinthians had been rebuked by Paul, and they didn't like that very much, but, you know, they, they liked Paul, and they wanted to be on good terms with Paul, so they wanted to know what to do. How do we get through this? The longing. And then even the word avenging. And you look at that whole process and you say, wow, this is a huge, complex set of emotions and behaviors and sometimes outcomes. And I don't, I don't know that the order is really important because if you've ever experienced wrong against you, you know that sometimes you feel all those things, this one that second, this one another second, and it just kind of spins around for you. You know, all of these things are in your heart, but not, you know, you can't handle all of them. Well, so you kind of go over them. But all of this is what Paul calls godly sorrow. I'm sorry I got caught doesn't touch the edge of it. I'm sorry it happened. I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry you were hurt. I'm sorry. There's a whole lot of things that go into a real godly sorrow. And one of the outcomes of godly sorrow, Paul says, is repentance. There's a change. And so number three, what repentance involves is a turning. This is the actual meaning of the word. I, I illustrated this with kids last week. Um, a little bit aware of what I was going to do today, but not, not completely. I kind of stole my thunder. I wish I'd have had this this morning. But turning means I'm going this way and I'm turning and I go the opposite way. And that's what repentance is really defined as. Repentance isn't cutting back a little bit. If I have an anger problem, getting mad only four times a day instead of five is not repentance. You understand? I talked last week about smoking. You don't quit smoking one cigarette less a day. You're still a smoker. <laughs> you, you can't sort of quit something. You can't sort of stop being a certain way. It needs to go away. And now you're understanding that this needs to come from the Lord because I've watched human beings and human beings have a tendency not to get this right if left alone. <laughs> Only something as powerful as the presence of Jesus and the Holy Spirit of God inside us can work the kind of change that is really needed. And that's why in the prison system and out there in the world and on the street and all the places where God is less visible, you see more pain, more violence, more harm, more struggle. And what has to happen is there has to be a turn. The godly sorrow produces repentance. The godly sorrow, all the things that happen on the inside of us produce something on the outside of us that can be 
be seen. And so there were times in Scripture when people were told, you know, that's great that you're sorry or anything. What we need is some fruit of repentance. We need to see some outward manifestation of their nature. So forth. I went to Acts 26, and I was surprised when I got there because this word seemed a little bit strange to me, and it's because it's in Acts 26, the end of the book, after Jesus has left the earth. These are the words of Jesus. They're great in my mind. These are the words of Jesus to Paul. This is what Jesus said to Paul on the road to Damascus. And so Jesus says, Paul, I am sending you to open the eyes so that they turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Now, there's several incredible things about that statement, but the, the most glaring one is Paul was not a believer in Jesus. Paul was putting people in jail who wanted to serve Jesus because he thought Jesus was dead and all these people were lying about Jesus being alive. And then one day, Paul met Jesus. And Jesus' words were, Saul, that was his name. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, uh, who are you? Because he can't go to the place that he's actually talking to Jesus. Jesus is dead. Except now, Jesus says enough to him in Acts 9 and he gets it. I'm really talking to Jesus. That means I'm persecuting Jesus. That means I'm doing the wrong thing by Jesus. And what does Paul do? He goes into the city where he was going to take Christians back and put them in jail or, or have them executed. And he changes, he turns, he does a 180, and now he's out on the streets of Damascus preaching the Jesus he came to persecute. That's turning. That's a real name. Darkness to light. Well, you know, Paul believed in God. He used to believe in Jesus. There are people today that are like that. You've got friends that believe in God, but they don't hear about Jesus. And frankly, honestly, it's because of the way some of Jesus' followers have behaved, and I apologize for that. But the reality is when you actually meet Jesus himself and you hear his word, then it comes through in such a way that you can turn to that because he's the real people. And it's darkness to light. It's where Satan has control to where God has control. Two completely different universes. And they exist around us at all times. Which universe do you want to live in? So Paul's three promises here from this passage are that a person who repents, a person who turns from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan and the dominion of God, is forgiven. And practically every time repentance is mentioned, forgiveness is on the heels of the same sentence. It's crucial, it's key. And then, instead of being servants in the house, as the prodigal son said, you know, I'll come back, Dad, I just, you just make me a hired servant. I, I won't even ask to be a son of you. <laughs> and the father says, get the road. Get the ready. Kill the fat cat. We're going to have a party. Because this son of mine has come home. The inheritance is intact. Well, he's already spent it all. Father says, well, let's do it again. And so forgiveness is there, inheritance is there, and most importantly, we are sanctified. And that's not a word we use this week, I'm sorry. What that means is we've been set apart from that dominion of Satan and placed into the dominion of God. We are, we are set apart, we are named. Our name changes, our status changes, our allegiance changes. We belong to God. And He can forgive and give that inheritance to children who want to act like they're in His household. 
If you're just sorry you got caught, there's no change involved in that. But if you're sorry that you did it, and caused the hurt, and you caused the pain, and you're guilty, and you want to be forgiven, and you want the blessings of the household, then God can make everything new and not give you a new old but really, really start the thought. That's why one of the most precious things that can occur in the church of our Lord is bringing about repentance. This is the way James said it. My brethren, these are the last two verses of James. If any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know. He who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Folks, that verse says everything else is all for in those sins. The turning occurs, and the reality is a person who knows better but strays can come back. But they don't come back to do what they did wrong all over again. They come back to turn from that. And so they're saved from the error of their way. Their soul is not destined for death as Judas was. And a multitude of sins are covered. Now a lot of people say, well, what sins are we talking about here? Well, first of all, it's the wrong way to hurt. I mean, let's, let's face it. When we say repent, that brings about forgiveness, then the first sin that gets covered is, is the offense. But what did he say a moment to you? Because if I'm not that person anymore, and I don't do it that way anymore, and I really turn from darkness to light, look at all the sins that are never going to occur. And please understand this verse is talking about Christians. And I know there are people who say, well, it's very Christian. They shouldn't do that. Well, wait. We're still human beings, folks. When we become Christians, we may have the Spirit of God in it, but we still got that noggin, you know, that gets us in trouble from time to time. Those desires, that will, you know, sometimes competes. And James, interestingly enough, calls Christians who stray sinners. Normally, the term reserved for people who are lost and outside of Christ. I don't think he's trying to teach, well, you know, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. You sin, you're just, you're just destined to be lost. That, that's not really what he's saying. He's saying, if you're going to live like a Christian, and you're going to go down this road, and you're going to be this kind of person, be this kind of person. Don't, don't get off track and cease to be that kind of person and think that you're going to end up in the right place. If you turn around and you get off the road, you're not going where you're headed. You've got to turn back around and get on the right road if you want to land where you hoped you were going to be. So the word sinner is appropriate. I want to ask this this morning. Don't we need a fresh start? I, I, I hate preaching lessons like this. I do. But you know what? Doctors hate saying, You're, you've got to turn to the deeds. You're going to require surgery. Some of the things about life aren't fun. They're really important. They're really necessary. And the whole idea of repentance, as we just read, is not just for the lost out there that, that don't know Christ. Sometimes it's for you and I. And a fresh start is such a blessing. I want to close with this verse. And honestly, it came out of our class this morning. I added it in the end of the lesson after looking for Gabriel for the young adults today. This is what Jesus said happens in heaven when a sinner repents. In the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Repentance is huge. 
It's <coughs> heaven for a party. And that's the prodigal son that follows to describe exactly that. When one person changes from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to the dominion of God, from what they shouldn't do to what they should do, heaven rejoices. And it just takes It's how big a deal this is. So if you need a fresh start, you got it. Ask God, did we back to that passage in Christ? We gotta pray, seek his face, stop the wickedness, so that God can forgive and heal. We'd love to help. We're not perfect. But we don't know where we're going. And on that path are people who need your example, your story, your help. Maybe it's your turn to me. So we invite you to come. We invite you to have that first start today. We do that right now while we stand. Worship Christ the King. Alleluia. Amen.